with February being here, this is the start of Public Domain Month here on the Cinema Snob. Why Public Domain Month? Well, why not? It's time we spotlighted a handful of movies who have since had their copyright run out. And I thought that movies I've previously featured had it rough. Those movies at least have organizations that claim them. Yes, Las Vegas Bloodbath has a copyright. These movies? No! These are the flicks whose owners decided to say, yeah, we're not gonna renew that. So first things first here on Public Domain Month, a movie by legendary filmmaker Abel Ferrara. No, not Bad Lieutenant, not King of New York, Driller Killer. I finally get to review a movie by an acclaimed director, and it's fucking Driller Killer! In addition to being in the public domain, Driller Killer also has the prestigious honor of being on the video Nasties even though it's not that bloody of a film. Entire newspaper and magazine ads were taken out in the UK condemning the film, not from anyone who actually saw the movie, but from moral guardians who based their entire opinion of the movie on this box cover. It was this cover alone that was largely credited for creating the Video Recordings Act of 1984, paving the way for the official banning of the video nasties. Driller Killer wasn't released uncut in the UK until 2002. And sure, yeah, I'm gonna sit here and I'm gonna trash the film myself. But I can. I've actually seen the movie. I don't base my entire opinion of the thing on a box cover. So let's see what all the fuss is about. What's this? The film should be played loud? Yeah, and in all caps too, apparently. Why does this have to be played loud? Is the dialogue that good? <laughs> I think that guy actually did get some spit on me. Good lord, look at these titles. Don't you just love it when a credit sequence feels like it's inducting you into hell? Oh, never mind, it's just a church. The scariest fucking church I've ever seen. This is our main character, Reno Miller, played by Jimmy Lane. Yeah, before I get a phone call from bullshit, I should probably tell you that Jimmy Lane is Abel Ferrara. Abel himself is the star of this flick, and here he is getting touched by Leo Tolstoy in the church. This man oh, is guy. Who knows, some fucking degenerate bum man. Wow, this is our lead character. If he were any sunnier, he'd be blind. Also, interesting piece of trivia, I don't know if this is true, but according to Ferrara, that's Bruce Willis. The guy washing the window? Bruce fucking Willis. Could be true, could be a lie. Regardless, it's a better career move than co-starring in North. Back to Reno, though. Just because he's a completely unlikable character doesn't mean we can't see him fuck in the backseat of a cab. Oh, and do you like punk rock? Good, because it'll randomly cut to it all throughout the film. And I'm talking real punk here. Not New Year's Evil New Wave punk, but the kind of punk where the performers even have their snot pierced. Reno is a struggling artist, working on his masterpiece, which is a bathroom painting for Buffalo Wild Wings? He lives with his girlfriend, and also Lucy in the Sky with diamonds here. What do you want over here? I want it. Right there. Where? You want to put a hook right here? Yeah. All right. Right there? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I think I want it over there. Over here? On the right side. On this side. All right. I want it over there. Oh my god, how do I fucking break it to them that there's already a hole in the door? I'm sorry, was that supposed to be porn? It's hard for me to tell anymore. Anyway, you were saying, Reno? What'd they do, send us to Bill of Madison Square Garden? 
What are they kidding me, man? How the hell are we supposed to pay this bill, man? What is it for three months? Price, what do we got here? Refrigerator, a couple of lights? I'm so glad they asked me to play this movie loud. It's imperative that I hear all of his bitching. As you can see, Reno is having money problems, and he attempts to seek help from his art manager. $500 now. And two months ago, it was $200 for your girlfriend's abortion. And three weeks later, it was $150 for extra material costs. Hey, hey times are tough? He also frequently goes to his rooftop to witness random acts of violence on the street. Holy shit! That mugger just pointed out that the guy had fake blood already on his back! Mix that in with the punk rock band who moves into the apartment right above Reno's, and he's slowly starting to go insane. I'm sorry, was that a flash of the son of Sam? Interesting to compare the lead in a movie called Driller Killer to a real-life serial killer who is known for using a gun! I can only imagine that even Son of Sam didn't bitch this much. You know what you know about? You know about how to bitch, and how to eat, and how to bitch, and how to shit, and how to bitch, but you don't know nothing about pain. Is that Abel acting or directing? Because if that's his directing style, he's nicer to his actors than Kubrick was. One night, Reno sees an ad on television for a power drill, which gives him some ideas. Like maybe something else for this character to do besides paint and yell at people. Hand drive, electric shaver, blenders, toasters, vacuum cleaners, stereo, power tools, even radio and TV. Anything that plugs into your wall sockets will plug into Portapack. That's right, Portapack, only $19.95. Plus, it comes with a free copy of Pac-Man! Maybe if the punk rock band quiets down, Reno won't buy a drill and kill people. Good work! You're almost performing the theme from Peter Gunn. The movie then attempts to make Reno more likable by having him harass a homeless guy. Jesus! Add in some Huey Lewis and Phil Collins, and this is a perfect recipe for American Psycho! I know what you're thinking, though. This movie's not as entertaining as Italian Batman. It was the lesbians, right? Now you're expecting every movie I do to have lesbians in it. Well, this movie has lesbians in it, too. Unknown to Reno, his girlfriend begins to grow doubts about their relationship, can't imagine why, when she gets a letter from an old lover. This Thursday is the fifth anniversary of the first time we met. Aw, that was nice of Ben Franklin to write her that letter. The movie has to race to the second act, though, so Reno goes out and buys the power drill. But who am I to question the mental capacity of someone whose artwork talks to him? Reno! Ciao. No. Oh shit! This is where he gets possessed by Vigo. So anyway, remember that homeless person from earlier? No! No! Well, now that he's killed someone, maybe he'll be a bit nicer. Hey, we're we gonna go to this club or what? In a minute. In a minute. That's what you told me a half hour ago. Okay. Just go kill another homeless man. Hey, what you got in your hand, mister? A drill! Throughout this, we're also treated to a live performance of the Sucks Pistols here. Might as well, we've seen them practicing half a dozen times in the movie. So what's the harm in watching them perform the same damn song in front of a live audience? Ugh, this song reminds me of a sensation, and I can't think of what. Oh, right. The same sensation I always get when watching these movies. The story gets randomly interrupted by a John Cleese character here, who starts to annoy random people on the street. <laughs> Never thought I'd say this, but can someone please drill this homeless guy? Hey, whatever calms Reno down, I guess. Ugh, you think that's attractive? Watch this. Fuck 
fuck's sake, even Travis Bickle couldn't relate to this guy. Not that it's ever followed up on, but Reno's exploits managed to make it into the press. Police autopsy revealed that the man was murdered by some type of power tool, possibly an electric drill. Oh shit, Reno's the killer! The moment comes for Reno to finally sell his piece of artwork, so let's see what the critic has to say. No, 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 this isn't right, this is nothing, this is shit! I love it when the snooty critics infiltrate the movies I watch. This becomes the last straw for Reno's girlfriend, who finally leaves him. Why the fuck did it take her this long? Baby, you wait, I don't need it. Eh, the suitcase only contains her $5 paycheck for appearing in the movie, so who cares? Well, someone's gotta go down for this. Might as well blame the critic. Something very important I have to show you. What, another buffalo? I have to speak to you about it tonight. You have to come down here tonight. Down there? I'll be down, but... Really? You're really gonna go over there, critic? What are the odds that the crazy starving artist you insulted is gonna kill you versus he actually did paint another piece of artwork within six hours? That's right, he killed you! And he drilled you to a door! Because that makes about as much sense as when he drilled the guy's hand to a brick wall. The movie ends with Reno tracking down his girlfriend and murdering her new bearded lover, then sneaking into the bed while she showers. Stephen, are you avoiding me now? Stephen, come here. I'm sorry, did the screen cut to red? I didn't notice, since that's the only color I was seeing throughout the entire film. Oh yeah, and that's the end, by the way. Thank God the hero got away with it. Ugh. If this guy were any less likable, he'd be a genocidal dictator. This movie is so grimy that taking a bath in piss and grease would make me feel more clean than watching this thing. For fuck's sake, the movie looks more diseased than a used needle. Even the word sleaze wouldn't fuck this movie. Well, that's our first entry in Public Domain Month. Glad I started on a happy note. This thing is more depressing than a basket of dead rabbits. Now if you'll excuse me, I need to go cheer myself up by watching children cry when they realize there's no Santa Claus. Bye! You should let him stick it up your ass with. You KY Jelly. Come on, her. It's taken me a whole two episodes into Public Domain Month to talk about the space opera. I'm surprised it took me this long to get into that, considering the countless science fiction box sets and category listings in the public domain. Why are there so many sci-fi movies in the public domain? Because it's pretty fucking easy to have two characters in a dark room talking about space shit and call it sci-fi. Is Star Odyssey one of those types of science fiction films? Absolutely not. It has much more than two characters who occupy boring sets and talk about space shit so they can call it a sci-fi film. Even the opening credit sequence looks like it's playing five minutes in heaven inside of someone's closet. Hey, as long as you can't see anything, that means the special effects can't be all bad. The action takes place on the Millennium Falcon here, and the set mainly reminds me of when I was a kid and I would dream about what the inside of my Atari looked like. Let's hope this movie is just 90 minutes of them playing Yar's Revenge. Oh, never mind. Looks like they just got the Jack Palance game. We seem to have interrupted the crew during their five-year mission to boldly go where no gay porn actors have gone before. Oh, and who are these people? You can't fool me. Those are monkeys in blonde wigs. The crew receive a message that a UFO is orbiting the Earth with hostile intentions. How hostile, you may ask? They destroyed the world's supply of stock footage. Now how is Nick Phillips gonna make another Death Nurse movie? A mere five seconds later, the ship gets word of all the specific damage the explosions have caused. 
After they knocked out London, they started on Accra. There are no survivors at Adelaide. And Tokyo Sub says the Okinawa base is just a junkyard. Well, thank God they got their stars and providing exposition dialogue. At the moment, the only person he might listen to is a young lieutenant, Oliver Carrera. Ah, Hollywood. Why isn't he working with us? Because he's too independent, stubborn, and undisciplined. I know they want us to think he's talking about Han Solo, but I'm secretly hoping for Pierre Kirby. With Earth's fate in question, only one wise leader knows how to defeat the... I don't know, let's say the Cyclos at this point? The movie isn't giving a lot of useful information. Professor Borgnine here knows of the secret galactic element sought after by various planets. Interium. The alien craft is protected with an armor of pure Enderium. Enderium? The mineral is called Enderium? That make you happy, James Cameron? You ripped off Star Odyssey! Please, Professor, continue on with the importance of Enderium. Just because we on Earth only have a kilo of Enderium? But we know nothing about conditions prevailing on the alien's galaxy. But, Uncle, Enderium is practically indestructible. Technologically, they may be ahead of us, but I think that... Just a minute. I'm sorry. Yes, let him finish his thoughts on why the Enderium must flow. They're barbarians. They don't place any sort of value on human life. But you're forgetting how the white man behaved towards the Negro. Yeah, I hate it when movies space bait. When he's done talking about Enderium, his plan is to assemble a team of galactic officers who share the same telekinesis, the Force, as he does. First up, Hollywood. No, that's his name, Hollywood. Remember Meshach Taylor from Mannequin? Well, think of Meshach as the straight version. Uh, no, darling. Please excuse me. Let's get the robot in here, too, to prove that they're in space. Eh, uh, just what the hell is the robot doing? He looks like he's searching for his keys. The professor has to convince the officer to help him out because it's not like the world is getting destroyed. I'll do what I can. But on my conditions only. That shot glass packs a hell of an echo. Sounds like Pussy Talk's chatterbox. But when you're a powerful space lord, just hypnotize people to do what you want. Yeah. You're right. Of course I'll do it. Cool. After this is when we meet the other member of the group, Dirk Laramie. That's a name that says, I've got a 13-inch cock and I smell like cigarettes. Dirk is cornered by space casino authorities for using the Force to cheat. Never thought I'd see the Force used in a way that would get someone's hand crushed with a hammer. Nice fighting. It's not often you witness the actors smoking opium with the screenwriters. Thank God the fight left Dirk with his trademark good looks. What a shame. You've gotten worse, Irene. Yes, you used to smile when I sexually harassed you. So far, no one in this movie is doing anything to stop the orbiting ships from destroying Earth. In fact, we haven't even seen most of the villains yet. All the heroes are doing is just hypnotizing each other. I have to think of my duty. Duty comes before anything else. That's right. Duty first. Duty first. Well, all right. Ugh, sorry. I just took a wicked star odyssey. The fuck did he do? Hypnotize him into thinking he has breasts? You know, at this point, I don't even feel like I'm watching Turkish Star Wars. I feel like I'm watching Turkish Turkish Star Wars. And while all of these characters are dicking around, look, Earth is about to be lost in an auction to the main villain of the movie. The man from the refrigerator may have claimed to be the waffle maker, but no, this guy really is the waffle maker. 
And there's a real galactic who's who of wretched scum and villainy here. Look, there's a representative from the planet Nilbog. There's Carrot Top. I think that's Bat Boy from the Weekly World News. And, ugh, my great-grandmother's legs. Sadly, the waffle maker wins Earth in the auction. I shall depart for Sol 3 on the first Aldis of Earth. Nothing else in that scene made sense. Why keep the last few words in? I particularly like when two characters go down to Earth to assess the damage in a junkyard. And the whole point of this is to rescue a couple of comic reliefs, because I guess this unit has a bad motivator. That, and he's not a robo-duck. Who authorized you to reactivate me? Why can't two poor robots commit suicide in peace? <laughs> I'm sorry, a suicidal robo-duck. The fuck? Did he rescue one of the prototypes from RoboCop 2? His wife is also rescued, and huh, it's nice that the sex of robots in the future is determined the same way that we differentiate Mickey and Minnie Mouse. Clearly they were made for each other, though, since they're both suicidal. I'm sorry our suicide pact was a failure. It was such a romantic idea, and I know how hard you tried to make it work. I don't mind, Tilt. One can't have everything in life. By the way, Tilly, I must have a splintered crystal in my memory bank. I can't remember why we made a suicide pact. You can't remember! You can say that this movie is no Star Wars, but I firmly believe that George Lucas wrote this. I say creatures like this shouldn't be allowed to run around loose. They ought to be kept in zoos. Now, Tilt, that's just prejudice. He has as much right to activate as we have, even if his skin is a different color. Ha ha ha! They're suicidal, and one's a racist! Thank God there's a couple characters in here just for the kids. The heroes meet up together to discuss the waning source of Endurium, which the professor keeps a private stock of. Clever. Like using a chainsaw to open an unlocked door. Some members of the team are sent down to the surface to dig for the remaining portions of Endurium. And oh, thank God, they brought the robots. God forbid this sequence goes on without needful comic relief. It's a question of robot dignity. Have it your way, but let's not argue about I'm it. I'm not arguing. You're the one who's arguing. These aren't robots. These are the ropers in tin suits. I hear they digitally added this guy in the background for the special edition. Oh, I'm sorry. I was paying attention to the plot. You were saying robots? Why don't we carve our names on a tree? In a heart? No, we can't do that because a tree is a living thing. And the law of robotics won't let robots damage living things. Given that you were prepared to do that, I guess that programming law is more of a suggestion. We can only damage each other. Like the way you hurt me by flirting with that automatic shoe polisher. Me? With a slot machine? Any chance this couple is going to reignite their old suicide pact? How rude. She just said, how rude. This movie isn't ripping off Star Wars. It's correctly predicting what Star Wars would become. The team is then surrounded by a group of androids. Yeah, the 20-somethings of the damned here are supposed to be androids. Oh, that's subtle, but it looks less like a lightsaber fight and more like the glow-in-the-dark condoms from Skin Deep. <laughs> That was the gesture of a man who really thought he was going to get his ass blown off. After endearing the unobtainium, I mean obtaining the endearium, the crew reports back. They're androids. I saw the evidence with my own eyes. One of them broke in two and he was all filled with gears and wires and electronic stuff. We couldn't afford to show that to you, much in the same way we can't even afford to show space. The Waffle Maker also has to report to his own men, and, oh, embarrassing, he caught Pinhead naked without his needles. The Professor is kidnapped during the... Sure that'll work itself out. 
The professor is kidnapped during the struggle, and the climax of the film centers around a mission to rescue him. And of course we got the robots to help. Every rescue mission needs shtick. Jill, let's get out of here. I'm frightened. There's nothing to be afraid of. They're not programmed to recognize us. They can't even see us. Well, this one must have the wrong program. He saw you because you were talking! Despite that fuck up, the professor manages to get rescued, resulting in a final battle sequence that looks like it was filmed in a teenager's basement using a light bright as lighting. Well, I'll say this, it looks better than CGI. At least they took a break from ripping off Star Wars in order to rip off Battlestar Galactica. I can't wait till Sci-Fi Channel makes the gritty remake of this, starring Katie Sackhoff as Dirk Laramie. Characters whiz by and shoot at each other in nondescript spaceships, and I don't know, there's not as much dignity in a space battle when you don't have a character named Porkins. Sadly though, not all of them make it out alive. Even in the great days of Hollywood, no movie star ever died so heroically. Well, that's not true. What about Whitehurst from Child's Play 3? Ah! Yep, that's what I thought of off the top of my head. You want to know the true pisser about this fucking movie? The thing clocks in at roughly an hour and 50 minutes long which in Italian ripoff terms might as well be three hours, especially in a movie where I have no idea what the fucking thing is supposed to be about. The movie has that attitude, like it just assumes you're supposed to know exactly what's going on when you walk into the theater. Motives aren't explained, plot points aren't explained, whether characters are good or evil is barely explained. How was I able to write a somewhat coherent review for this? I read a synopsis online, and even they didn't seem to know what the hell happened in this thing. It's a little hard to know the true plotline of the movie when the villain lives at the end and we're given this as closure. I finally remembered why we wanted to commit suicide. Really, Tilt? Yes, because you could never prove your love by going all the way with me. I can make some little design changes, adjust a few details, and you can prove your love like any other people. <laughs> So is that what I was supposed to be worrying about? Whether the lead characters from Heartbeeps were gonna get fucking genitals? And as for the movie's length, I imagine the goddamn thing was originally longer because the movie seems to just give up on itself at the end. I think I'd like to get a nice little planet of our own. Ladies and gentlemen, the all- Yeah, there's how you set up a sequel. You just cut the guy off in mid-sentence. It's one thing for no one to claim copyright on a movie, but Star Odyssey is so fucking bad, I'm surprised that even the public domain claims it. They're pretty delicate, these androids, huh? Let's go before some more arrive. <laughs> ha! I'm really torn here. Part of me wants to make fun of this film because, well, look at the title, and also that's my job. But another part of me feels really, really bad for doing so. Why is that? Because it's in black and white. How could a film shot in pristine blacks, grays, and whites possibly share the same gutter slugs as a chatterbox or a violent shit? It is true that when you make a color movie black and white, it instantly makes it classier. Sort of like when the Three Stooges wear a tuxedo. Makes them look classy, yes. Gets them into fancy parties, yes. But they're still gonna cause mass amounts of brain damage on each other with a pocket wrench. I don't know if you know this, but whenever someone switches a color movie to black and white, a film critic somewhere in the world comes a little. So let's take a look at a movie that was always in black and white. 
Werewolf in a Girl's Dormitory. And with its 1961 release date, that makes it the oldest movie I've done on the Cinema Snob. Uh, <laughs> now that's a still shot. Looks like Grace Kelly jumped into the fly machine with Robin Williams. Either that or it's the geek getting pegged. Yeah, go ahead and Google that one. And what's with this theme song? I have the sudden urge to go to a sock hop. And I don't even have socks! We're introduced to the local all-girls reform school, and don't mind them in the background, they're just rehearsing for Bruno Mattai's SS Girls. Be calm. Wolf doesn't bother anyone. What? That's the wolf? Cheat production movie? It's clearly a German Shepherd. This date marks the arrival of their new professor, Dr. Alcott, who is so dreamy that, <laughs> yeah, just wait till Dr. Indiana Jones arrives, her head will explode. I like how the other students quickly rush the fainted blonde to safety, or they're gonna leave her on someone's front porch and light her on fire. It's a terrible prank. We find out that Dr. Alcott has a troubled past, but it's the early 60s. Nothing that a little scotch, scotch, and more scotch can't solve. Plus, given that every minor character in this facility looks like Peter Lorre, I'm sure a troubled past is quite common. Christ, what do you call it when a receding hairline turns into a reverse mohawk? One of the more rebellious students, named Mary, sneaks off into the night, and I just don't like this scene without any classic Disney-esque sneaking around music. <laughs> if you get that reference, then you are awesome. She sees Mary, but why doesn't she try to stop her? She's the one who doesn't want to be seen. Funny if she had a lover. A lover? And who could it possibly be? Thanks, Bob Euchre, but if I wanted someone providing commentary here, I'd prefer it to be more insulting. This show is awful, terrible, disgusting. See you next week? Of course. Mary wanders off into the woods, and ugh, I hate it when creepy eyes show up on the TV. Makes me think I'm looking in a mirror. Oh, never mind. It's only Walt Disney himself. Walt here plays Sir Alfred, who's being blackmailed by Mary due to illicit affairs. Aren't you forgetting, Mary, that you have the letters? They're burned. Remember, they're important proof. Very important. I don't think you know how blackmail works. You don't claim to have a solid piece of evidence and then taunt your victim with the fact that you burned said evidence. This chick is so bad at blackmailing, I'm expecting her to pay him the money. But it doesn't matter anyway, because the werewolf shows up and eats her. <laughs> well, he's eating something, I guess. Sir Alfred runs home to the calm, nurturing arm of his wife and... <laughs> looks like Mickey Rooney's dick. You're not only thoroughly miserable, Alfred, you're without a doubt a pitiful imbecile. She's just upset because someone dropped a house on her sister. Or she's looking for that missing Sampo mineral. Oh dear, this werewolf situation is worse than I thought. It's removing whole frames of the film. No, no, it's not possible. Take this, distrib- Luckily, the campus has its own coroner, so let's see what killed this girl. Oh, enormous schwanstucker. <laughs> it's quite an unfortunate death stare. The coroner's report is gonna say she died while being interrogated by Johnny Wad. Our new main character, Priscilla, takes over the investigation, which leads to Kate Jackson's involvement with a professor slash devil worshiper who recruits students at the girls' academy to join his... Yeah, sorry about that. That was Satan's school for girls, wasn't it? Even though that movie was in color and this one's in black and white, I can't tell the two movies apart! Priscilla finds a letter about Mary's involvement with the blackmail, and even spots another letter talking about how Dr. Alcott was recently acquitted of murder. But I'm sure there's nothing weird about him. Something you need to know? Have you seen Mary's body? <laughs> yes. It was hilariously awkward looking. I know. That you remember her the way you last saw her. 
Oh, I will. With her dead body looking like a kid who has just received his first Nintendo 64. But the doctor isn't the only one in the school who has their own weird backstory. She was living with that poor Mary in town. One night a sailor was trying to beat Mary, almost strangled her. Then Priscilla, defending her friend, almost killed the sailor. I remember that. I think the sailor went on to write a song about it. The sailor said, Brandon, you're a fine girl. You're a fine. Priscilla's investigation leads her to a dark room where, oh good, big girl Caprice here can explain everything. I know this scene. This is the part where she tells her Leonardo DiCaprio is the detective and the patient. My husband is perhaps a philandra, but he's not an assassin. Mary was assassinated? Kind of a strong word. Let her rest in peace. But she was assassinated. Oh, okay. Stop saying she was assassinated. She was killed by a werewolf. That's like saying Jason Voorhees assassinated Crispin Glover. Before things can get too homely here, she's whisked away by Dr. Handsome. <laughs> Don't be afraid. It's only a wolf that must have just fallen into one of my traps. I like to trap wolves and make them watch old episodes of Perry Mason with me. <laughs> it's what I do. Actually, it was just Lady Smiley getting injected with sunshine, lollipops, and rainbows, which naturally kills her. Just in time, too, because the werewolf makes another appearance in the form of Harry Reams. Well, there's another explanation for the shocked look on Mary's corpse. One day I'm gonna get that filthy animal. And that does it for Werewolf in a... Okay, no, that's not really the end. The geek really did spoil me on these movies. Now every time I watch one of these, I expect the characters to just give up and end the movie 45 minutes in. I don't think that's ever gonna happen again. Which is surprising, since this one kind of has the geek in it. Unfortunately, the movie ca oh. 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 Excuse me. Oh. Someone just changed a color movie to black and white. Unfortunately, the movie continues in... an Old West saloon? The fuck is going on here? They better be careful or Buford Tannen's gonna make them dance. Sir Alfred attempts to lay blame for the killings on Sinister McCaretaker here, and it almost works because the scene turns into a crazy character actor version of Rebel Without a Cause. <laughs> Meanwhile, Dr. Alcott has his exposition meeting with the Dean, where he explains the reason he was on trial for murder was for giving an overdose of a werewolf antidote to an attractive werewolf he was once acquainted with. Believe me, I'm well versed on this story since he takes about 10 minutes to explain it to us. It took five minutes to explain why Norman and Mrs. Bates were the same person. It shouldn't take you any longer than that to explain why you killed a werewolf. But the werewolf isn't the only cruel beast on campus, as Igor suffocates one of the girls. Eh, I don't know though, maybe she just had electroshock therapy. Are you all auditioning for Willie Scott? The fuck is with all the screaming? Igor doesn't make it very far and commits suicide in front of the students and faculty. What's this? A suicide note? Maybe now you'll believe that I'm not Marty Feldman. Oh Christ, what have we done? Luckily, Dr. Alcott is there to comfort the girls with his stunning good looks. Was he the monster? Perhaps the monster never existed. Walter smothered the girl. Now please. Okay, that plot point didn't work for Monster A Go Go, and it sure as shit isn't gonna work here. Dr. Alcott and Priscilla take it upon themselves to finish the investigation. I want to know exactly what happened that night you met with Mary in the Woods. You know, does anyone teach at this school? Or does anyone learn? Seems like all they do is solve murders or get murdered. The two confront Sir Alfred, who I'm sure has a logical explanation on why the movie wants us to think he's guilty. Huh. Well, first things first, 
dig the bullet out of his head to see if it's silver. Soon enough, though, we actually do see who's been harboring the werewolf, and... Kay, who the fuck is that? That short-haired character from a prior scene who didn't have a fucking word of dialogue? Oh yeah, she left a lasting impression on me. And what's going on here? She's got the wolf chained up? And the serum is taken from dog cooties? I expected this movie to go a lot of places, but horrifying experiments of the SS last days was not one of them. So, let's find out who the werewolf is. Wow, it was the Dean. Didn't predict that from this earlier line of dialogue. If you should ever find out that I am the monster, I should like to be treated the same as you would like to be. I understand you perfectly. The only way that would have been more predictable is if the Dean were Edmund Perdom playing the same evil Dean from Pieces. Unfortunately, Jerry Lee wakes up and kills Fraulein Doctor, leaving Dean Wolfenstein to grieve over her death. Get back here! A beast sometimes is especially sensitive. It's true. Perhaps he feels guilty. Why isn't anyone figuring this out? He'd be less transparent if he wrote an OJ-style book called If I Were a Werewolf. When Priscilla finds out details about the doctor's death, she brings it to the Dean's attention, of course! Oh, for fuck's sake, just turn into a werewolf. This girl couldn't piece together handcuffs. <laughs> After turning into the wolf, he has a Kirk Gorn-style fight with Dr. Alcott, resulting in the wolf being shot with a magic 60s gun. You know, the type of gun that doesn't leave any bullet holes, but they kill you anyway? And no need for any kind of epilogue, the wolf's dead! Movie's over! Werewolf in a Girl's Dormitory was an Italian production, and though being in the public domain, the film came from a script by prominent exploitation writer Ernesto Gastaldi, whose work stretched from spaghetti westerns like My Name is Nobody and one of the Trinity movies, the crime thriller Almost Human, plenty of giallos such as The Case of the Bloody Iris, and Your Vice is a Locked Room and Only I Have the Key, Giallos, the movie title equivalent of overcompensating. He also penned the Italian post-apocalyptic epic 2019 After the Fall of New York, plus Once Upon a Time in America? The hell? Nice to know he could write both trash and a multiple award-winning epic. He's got a slightly bigger resume than the girls' dormitory director, Paolo Huch, who was mainly known as the casting director for Caligula. So he may not know how to direct a werewolf movie, but that man sure can cast a vagina. He couldn't be the monster. But why not? Because Walter had a dog. What is this now? The fourth, fifth, sixth movie I've done that's got John Carradine in it? He's like the actor who these exploitation directors like to Trojan horse into their movies. You're sitting there watching a movie about bikini-clad Amazonian babes on an island, and then, BAM! Superimposed Carradine in the corner of the screen! And yeah, I probably should have guessed that he was in the movie because, according to the box cover, he's the star. But I'm embarrassed enough as it is to be watching these movies. I don't look at the box covers. I just hang my head in shame and hope that even I don't witness what the fuck I'm buying. Hell, I even talk about John Carradine when I cameo in other people's reviews. Fuck it. At this point, I should just change the name of the show from The Cinema Snob to The John Carradine Show. I train to Mondovina, I train to the end, running hard and running fast to meet my future and away from my past, taking the gamble that cannot last, I train to the end. Just kidding. 
I'm not really going to do that, but I am going to talk about another John Carradine movie, Billy the Kid vs. Dracula. <laughs> yeah, it exists. This is actually a step up from the other John Carradine movies I've done, because unlike those movies, in this one, he really is the star. This isn't like Demented Death Farm Massacre, where he narrates a scene or two of footage shot 20 years after the bulk of the film. No, no, he has a majority of the screen time in this movie. So that's good for John Carradine fans, but bad for John Carradine. Oh, is this how you want to start your movie off? With a fucking day for night shot? Might as well start out with a close up of the scene marker. It'd take you out of the movie just as much. I don't know what's more fake, the night sky or the fake bat floating around on screen. I make fun of this opening scene, yes, but it does introduce Dracula early on and in one of the most frightening character introductions ever. Carradine's eyes are even scarier than the shoddy editing. Dracula kills the campers and then flies off to bring us the opening credits. <laughs> eh, it's better than the blood wipe effect from Crazy Fat Ethel 2. Dracula, seen here on his way to a Laurel and Hardy meet and greet, sits quietly in the stagecoach and only speaks up every once in a while to make psycho eyes with Shelley Winters. Mrs. Benson. She is young and beautiful. Benson. He's genuinely creepy in this! Look at this still shot! This is gonna dominate my nightmares for the next several months, which admittedly is a step up from this. I'm surprised I can even make out Carradine's eyes with all the day for night shit going on. Who in their right fucking mind ever thought that in effect were a blue sky substitute for a black sky and makes your actors appear darker than if they actually just shot at night was a good substitute for shooting at night? Any idiot who would shoot a movie like that is probably stupid enough to intentionally leave the lens cap on. Why not? Either way, you still can't see shit! The stagecoach stops for a bit in Indian territory, where Carradine gets to crazy face fuck the camera again. Yes, she's confused as to why they reused that earlier shot from the movie as well. Now that it's daylight, we can get a better look at the Indians, and why do I get the feeling this is going to be as authentic as F Troop? Since Billy the Kid's name is also in the title, he might as well be in the movie too. Though they probably should have changed his name to Billy the 40-something. Let's just hope they keep the rough edge and violent nature of Billy the Kid intact. I wonder what your mother will say when you tell her we're going to get married. Well, you know she likes you. Yeah, but uh, Uncle Jim from Boston, you know, he might not like the idea when he finds out I'm Billy the Kid. Look, you're not Billy the Kid anymore. Since coming here, you're William H. Bonney. Betty Bonney. You know, I kind of like that. Oh, me too. <laughs> oh, gee willikers. <laughs> you know Billy the Kid wasn't Roy Rogers, right? Meanwhile, at the town nearby... It... What the fuck is Professor Fate doing here? Oh, sorry, that's Dracula. It's my first time seeing him without the shitty day for night effect covering his entire wardrobe. Upstairs and to the left. Thank you. My name is James Underhill. Oh, is that his name? I've been calling him Dracula this entire time. How embarrassing. Must have missed the fact that the title is Billy the Kid versus James Underhill. Yeah, won't you come in, Mr. Mr. Uh, Bonnie. Most folks just call me Billy. I'm the foreman of the Double Bar B Ranch. Fuck. <laughs> as intimidating as Carradine is here, fucking Billy the Kid has the menace of Rick Schroeder and the range of Channing Tatum. Word is spread that the stagecoach was recently attacked, and since the sheriff isn't around, clearly Billy the Kid, a fucking outlaw, should lead the investigation. First things first, though, gotta keep the vampire rumors under wraps. I, I thought you were... A vampire. I, a vampire. What are you talking about? 
I never heard anything so ridiculous. Oh, they got vampires on the brain. That's all they talk about. Yeah, even in the 1800s, young girls were obsessed with shitty vampire movies. At first, the girl here thinks that Carradine is a vampire. Can't imagine why. With that look, he's either a vampire or Jafar. So to help calm them down, Carradine offers for the girls to stay in his room, thus proving that he can't be crazy. Yeah, I know you think I'm a serial killer and all, but I can ease your mind. Come see my basement. And they do fucking sleep in his room. And wouldn't you know it, he kills the daughter. Hmm. <laughs> if only John was still around to do a crazy eyes off. The parents naturally mourn over some coffee the next day, but it's fine because Billy the Kid is there to cheer them up. Maybe they'll go to the church where the Reverend is Al Swearingen. That would make sense in this backwards-ass view of history. Thank God the bad tracking isn't in day for night. I can see the whites of that really fucking clearly. When Billy hears that his girlfriend Betty is spending time with not Dracula, he races to her rescue only to find out James Underhill is her uncle. That would be more impressive if he was Dracula, but he's not. He's James Underhill. Although, given that he just took her picture off someone from the stagecoach, he is as much her uncle as he is Dracula. So it's all a big misunderstanding, and Billy the Kid can get smooth with his girlfriend again. Anything ever happened to you, I... Why should anything happen to me? I don't know, but I only know I'm, I'm afraid for you. Well, I never thought I'd live to see the day Billy the Kid was afraid of anything. <laughs> Seriously, watching this guy play Billy the Kid is like watching Shirley Temple play Calamity Jane. Not even a fight scene can make this guy seem badass, because he goes down in one punch. This fucking guy is no Emilio Estevez. <laughs> Dear God, I'm a fucking cinema snob. Did I really just say that? One of the local immigrants attempts to ward off the evil by hanging up a crucifix, but no such luck, it didn't keep the director or the film crew away. I like that the stereotype of the wise, evil-predicting Latino woman existed even back in the drive-in movie days, but of course, since this is a 60s movie, she's not actually played by a Latino woman. Billy the Kid has his own vampire information source with Barbara Bush here. A vampire is a ghost which leaves its resting place at night to suck the blood of living victims, humans when possible. Sometimes it kills its victims. Now you know as much about it as I do. Yes, but none of you still know anything about Dracula! Funny how a movie whose villain can't go out in the daylight mostly shoots its night scenes in daylight. Not that it matters, because it still shows Dracula in actual daylight! He tries to eye-fuck his niece for a bit so she can help him check out a nearby cave. Convenient, too, how the camera crew in front of him lights the hallway before his torch can. Billy tries telling the vampire theory to the sheriff, and... <laughs> hey, sheriff, you know who you're talking to? That's Billy the Kid! The fucking outlaw that you should probably arrest? When Dracula Underhill, or whatever, hears Billy the Kid's plan to expose him as a vampire, his plan seems to be to poke Billy's eyes out with his chin, and he also locks his niece away so Billy can't see her anymore. I was waiting for a chance to tell you we're going to be married. Married? Marrying a notorious gunman? I won't allow it. Luckily, that notorious gunman isn't here, but the guy playing Billy the Kid in this movie is. <laughs> he also sends Billy's rival to the bar to kill him, but given that Billy uses a gun and not his fists this time, he wins. What's the matter, Billy? You just killed Dan Thorpe, Doc. Hmm, yeah, I can see why you'd be upset, even though you're supposed to be Billy the Kid, WHO KILLED SEVERAL PEOPLE! Carradine's plan is to turn Betty into a vampire, and in one sequence, we get to see him seduce her. But the effect it leaves is less that he's a slick, seductive vampire, and more that he's a dirty old man who is blushing at the sight of his niece. Regardless, he does manage to bite her, and one can only hope these top-notch medical examiners can piece this shit together. 
I don't like it. I don't like it a bit. Yeah, with her now being a hell spawn and all. Just doesn't seem possible yet. <laughs> right? Finally, a character who overthinks the movie even more than I do. When Carradine shows up to take Betty away, the doctor tries to prove the vampire theory, even though that vampire or not, he's still clearly fucking evil. Does it really matter if he's a vampire at this point? Well, let's just hope that he handles not seeing himself in the mirror with a bit of dignity. He takes Betty back to his swank love cave to finish out his ritual of turning her into a vampire. I guess there's more to becoming a vampire than just getting bitten. Or is this just to draw things out until Billy the Kid can show up and save the day? Idiot. Don't you know that vampires are immune to blanks? Okay, obviously he's able to just stand perfectly still when bullets come racing towards his body, but the gun itself is powerful enough to knock him on his ass. Thank God Billy's got a wooden stake slash metal knife. What the fuck was with that bat? It makes you think that Carradine turns into the bat and flies away, yet his body is still there and decomposes moments later. So I guess it was just coincidence that there happened to be a bat there, and these two events have nothing to do with one another. The movie ends with Betty returning back to normal, and Billy carrying her off into the sun that you can kinda see outside the small entrance to the cave. So if Betty here wakes up once Carradine is dead, does that mean now that his previous victims are waking up buried in a cemetery? That's fucking dark! But why would I expect a movie called Billy the Kid vs. Dracula to make sense when it doesn't even have Dracula in it? The word Dracula is never, not once, mentioned in the movie. He's just a random vampire who wants to pork his fake niece and make Billy the Kid jealous. Hmm, yeah. Sounds like a John Carradine movie. Honestly, though, Carradine's performance is one of the highlights here. Much like Christopher Walken in The Country Bears, the performance's appeal comes from how intense he plays the role. No. You're busier than I ever imagined you. He turns in a genuinely creepy performance in a movie that does not call for that kind of commitment. He gives the same kind of performance here than he would if he was acting in Francis Ford Coppola's Dracula. Did you enter my room? Uh, yeah, I, I, I wanted to straighten up. I demand privacy. I gave orders no one was to enter it. I, I, I'm sorry. See that it doesn't happen again. When he gives a look like he wants to kill someone, you fucking believe that John Carradine himself has actual blood catered to him on the set. And all for a movie called Billy the Kid vs. Dracula. How the hell did they even think that those two figures could mesh together in a movie? I don't know what they were expecting with this mixture, but all they came up with was a plate of Santorum. Did they just pick two names out of a hat? I wonder who else they would try to pair. How about teaming up Jesse James with Frankenstein's daughter? I know it exists. I'm doing it next. There's nothing broken. Oh, You're gonna be all right. It's time now to continue Public Domain Month on the Cine. <laughs> Yeah, what? What do you mean it's not February anymore? Shouldn't it be the 28th? The fuck is a leap year, and why isn't it one of those? What kind of month only has 28 days in it? Well, had I known that, maybe I wouldn't have scheduled a theme month on the shortest month of the year. What do you mean this bit is going on too long? Okay, fine, I'll cut to the opening credits. Oh, 
one more thing. <clears throat> Who the fuck are you? Well, Public Domain Month is going over time, it seems. Not that it really matters. Instead of reviewing five random crappy movies, I've just been reviewing five crappy movies that have one thing in common with each other. Why the hell did I even do a Public Domain Month anyway? Cough, DVD, cough. Our final entry in Public Domain Month is Jesse James meets Frankenstein's daughter. Because there's nothing more terrifying than the offspring of a famous horror character? Billy the Kid vs. Dracula and this movie were both released simultaneously in 1966 as a double feature at local B-movie theaters. They were the final films of director William Bodine, a famous one-shot style director who helmed several episodes of Lassie, Rin Tin Tin, and The Green Hornet. Many notable directors ended their career on a terrible movie. Bodine's ended on a double tap. Already this movie has the rotted corpse, foul stench of Billy the Kid vs. Dracula. Look at this, even the fucking background painting is in day for night. The movie opens in a southwestern United States town as a local family, mourning over a bottle of screwdriver, prepares to leave their town because of kidnappings and strange experiments being performed by the local Dr. Frankenstein. Yes, I forgot that the events of Frankenstein take place on the Mexican-U.S. border. As you can see, though, the Doctor is quite mad, as she seems to be creating the movie Young Einstein. This is Maria, granddaughter of the notorious Victor Frankenstein. Wait a minute. Granddaughter? But you chose to refuse me. Maria Frankenstein, granddaughter of a count. The title clearly states that the movie is about Frankenstein's daughter. First, Billy the Kid vs. Dracula doesn't even have Dracula in it, but now this one can't even get the daughter of Frankenstein? I realize that Frankenstein's daughter is an easier title to say than Frankenstein's granddaughter, but at this point, just call the movie Jesse James Meets Frankenstein. That is still her last name. Unfortunately, Maria's experiment doesn't work, resulting in the continued death of her subject. What the fool I've been! Yes, these experiments are harder when you don't have Boris Karloff, Peter Boyle, or Robert De Niro. It's a shame, too, because had the body come back to life, I imagine Maria's bedside manner would have been top-notch. My, you're a humanitarian. You should have stayed in Europe and given pink pills to sweet old ladies. Jesus, even Ilsa the She-Wolf would call her a bitch. We are safer here than anywhere else. Was the dun-dun-dun really fucking necessary? Oh yes, I'm completely on the edge of my seat at the prospect of them staying in their house. He must be big and strong. Strong as a giant. Okay, I don't know how Red Brown and Martin Cove are gonna help them out, but I'll bite. Here's where we're introduced to Jesse James, fresh off of auditioning for Lee Van Cleef's character and for a few dollars more. I heard that Jesse James was killed up at Northridge. There are a lot of folks who think that the James boys were wiped out. Well, I'm Jesse, all right. And there's only one way to prove it. Hmm. That's weird. After Billy the Kid vs. Dracula, I'm not used to seeing a famous outlaw act like an outlaw. The man in the fight is Jesse's partner, Hank, who I think is around just to make Jesse James look smarter. You better pay up, mister. Why should I? Well, for one thing, I beat your man fair and square I did. Uh, for another thing, we need the money real bad. The movie switches over to a meeting of the Wild Bunch, who are awaiting the arrival of Jesse James and Hank. I forgot, who directed the movie The Wild Bunch? Sam fucking Beckenfall! Ah! <laughs> oh, yeah! The signal is then given when Jesse shows up. Hello? Sounds like a giraffe is dying. The Wild Bunch wants Jesse James to help them rob a stagecoach, and the tension already starts mounting between Jesse and Wild Bunch member Lonnie. And I hear the real Jesse James was shot to death. Everybody is trying to make me a corpse. Well, I don't like it. You trying to make me a liar? 
Okay, why couldn't he have also played Billy the Kid? I know he's too old for the part, but so is this guy! At least with John Lupton, the actor playing Jesse, you get a guy who seems to have at least looked up the words outlaw and badass in the dictionary. The actor playing Billy the Kid acted more like he was just out to get his Western reenactment badge from the Boy Scouts. But let's not forget about Hank. Jesse and me have looked down many a gun barrel for a lot less than that. Hey, eh, Jesse? Right, Hank. Hank has the physique of Jason Statham, but with the tact of simple Jack. Lonnie immediately rejects the idea of the money being split evenly, so he rats the gang out to... Oh, now how is the Andy Griffith show gonna solve anything? You know this movie is called Jesse James Meets Frankenstein's Daughter, not Jesse James Meets Lonnie. I don't care about any of this. Though that title would be more accurate, since Lonnie is actually in this movie. The trap is set to swarm the stagecoach. Get ready, boys. First coach is coming. That's the first one. Hank is stupid, not the audience. You don't have to repeat things to us. Unfortunately, the marshal and his men show up to take down Jesse James and the Wild Bunch. Jesse, look out! Oh crap, they activated his I Got Shot switch. While the Wild Bunch is taken out, Jesse and the wounded Hank manage to escape and happen upon... Hey, hey, it's that family from earlier in the movie. He's been shot. Does it count as exposition dialogue if she's explaining something that's already on the screen? Regardless, I like how her dialogue literally rolls off her tongue. Was it God's will that I was think Rojas should die? Juanita tells her family that she needs to take Hank to Maria Frankenstein, as she's the only doctor who can help him. Wow, that's a glowing recommendation when a family that is leaving town because of your sadistic, Nazi-esque experiments can still recommend you to a dying man. Juanita, Jesse, and Hank make the long trip to Maria's when they're attacked by a Caucasian in red face. Oh, the horror! We're about halfway through this movie, and really, it doesn't even matter if the title is Frankenstein's daughter or granddaughter, because so far, Jesse hasn't met either one of them. Eventually, though, they do make it to town. That is the place I told you about. There's where the doctors are. Oh, you mean behind the giant painting? Do we just run through it like the fucking Roadrunner? What happened? Well, he uh, shot himself clean in his gun. Oh, it was terrible, Doctor. The bullet moved so fast it didn't even leave a hole in his shirt. Meanwhile, the Marshal and Lonnie are busy tracking down the set from Rio Bravo, but never mind that. Maria has decided to fix up Hank, feeling that Hank is the perfect specimen for her brain transplant surgery. Jesse James himself, though, tries to get a little backstory from Maria. Our experiments were not always understood or appreciated in our own country, so we had to leave. Yes, they didn't approve of you butchering their accent. Jesse jumps into action when the Marshal and Lonnie show up to ask questions, but Maria successfully sends them away. Just the Marshal looking for some outlaws. Oh, uh, did he say who they were? And did they say if they were terrible at acting casual? Luckily, Hank will be in surgery for a while, so Jesse gets to have a little alone time with Rosalita. Wow, the sound of crickets is incredibly prominent for two in the afternoon. Why must I go? Because I do not trust the Frankensteins. Really? That's funny, seeing how you sent them to her. Jesse makes his move on Rosalita, and it's his lucky day, because minutes later, Maria makes her move on Jesse. I'm thinking right now he really wishes the title was Jesse James fucks Frankenstein's daughter. Unfortunately, though, Jesse turns her down, causing Maria to go into a jealous rage with her brother Rudolph. Personally, though, I think she's only upset because years from now, she really wanted to say this line. No time for love, though. She's got plenty of work in the laboratory to do. Just add a couple of stilts and 20 gallons of gravy, and she'll finally have her very own Tor Johnson. Though with all of that cocaine added to the brain, I think she's only going to end up with Boy George. Oh, now what is putting a crown of thorns on him going to do? 
After attaching the army helmet slash bar window sign, she's ready to bring Hank back to life. You are evil. Do you understand? Evil. Nice. She's bringing him back to life with a sound that'll make him want to kill himself. Rudolph, however, wants to sabotage your experiment by injecting Hank with poison. No, no, no. Why not? Oh, we're wasting time. Wow, I was wondering why his name was Dr. Subtle. Igor! Save me! Igor, save me! Wait, Igor? The creature's name is now Igor? Yes, I almost forgot that not only was Igor a six foot five bodybuilder, but he was also Frankenstein's monster as well. While all of this is going on, Jesse James is set to town on a wild goose chase by Maria to pick up medicine for Hank. Hmm, what's this? Stuck in a terrible movie with Jesse James, we can make a break for it when the director reloads the camera. I understand. While the pharmacist makes Jesse wait, he sneaks off to the sheriff's station to let Lonnie know that Jesse is across the street. Johnson, you see this? This is made to take care of tough guys. Well, that, and it can still kill pretty much anyone you point it at. Lonnie then sneaks in to shoot. Oh, no, no, no. You're supposed to wait till he fixes a painting first. Realizing he's been double-crossed, Jesse races back to save Hank. I go to the march at Shelby for help. I know what it'll mean if I bring him back with me, but I'd rather see you dead than see you looking like Hank. I still have to go back to Hank. Five minutes later... Save your strength, Jesse James. You will need it. Huh. This might turn out really bad. She could turn him into the movie American Outlaws. The Marshal is no luck in saving Jesse, but luckily, once Rosalita comes in, it reminds Hank that he once had a two-minute conversation with her. So he strangles the doctor. Then the script remembers that Hank has a different brain inside of his head and probably wouldn't even remember Rosalita, so he hauls off to kill Jesse as well. Damn, his one weakness, shooting smoke in his face. Don't feel bad for Hank, though. He's left with one of the greatest tombstones ever. I hope to God that when I die, my tombstone reads something like, Here lies the cinema snob. He once reviewed Troll 4 with Phalus. The only tombstone that's better than that is the movie Tombstone. Rosalita desperately wants to ride along with Jesse, but he turns her down, figuring it best to ride off into the sunset with the marshal, and, I don't know, go fight vampires at the Titty Twister or something? So which one is better, Billy the Kid versus Dracula, or Jesse James meets Frankenstein's daughter? Oh, well that's easy! The answer is The Searchers. But honestly, even though Billy the Kid had that creepy performance by John Carradine, Jesse James meets Frankenstein's daughter at least has a competent hero, across the board better performances, a much bigger story, and far less day for night shit. Then again... Billy the Kid vs. Dracula was 10 minutes shorter. I don't know which one I'd rather watch. Seriously though, the Jesse James movie is better. But that doesn't take away from whose bright idea it was to make these two movies. Movie Monsters and American Outlaws? What the fuck? It's probably not a mystery that there were drugs involved in coming up with these movies, given that it was the late 60s and all, but the question should be, what kind of drugs? How about you make a movie where Calamity Jane squares off against the creature from the Black Lagoon? Wouldn't be any more stupid than the rest of these movies. The only pairing I could think of that would be worse would be the pairing of James Franco and Anne Hathaway. <laughs> That isn't just like a wolf. 